Ladies and gentlemen, happy, happy Tuesday. And welcome back for another episode If Not Now When. And today, guys, I am so beyond excited to, to introduce you today's special guest, Julia Wench. And Julia has such a beautiful story, guys. Uh, she has such a big heart, big passion for social entrepreneurship and social impact. After two MBA, Julia followed her path into management consulting because why not? Then two years later, she soon discovered the truth for herself, which led her to create the Authenticity Guide. And that inspired her to transition her career into a career coach. And today, she's also a keynote speaker, a contributor to the Forbes magazine. It's a fancy magazine, guys. She also be featured in the Business Insider. She has so much insight to share with all of us today. With that, I am so excited. Thank you so much, Julia. And welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Wen. Thank you for your beautiful enthusiasm. It is like medicine to me today on election <laughs> Day, which is a day that many of us have woken up very worried and anxious, but you have just sort of made me feel better. So thank you. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, so Julia, tell us, you know, sure, to, uh, take us back to your journey. How does all the magic get started? So I started um, my career in corporate finance in New York, uh, which is where I'm from originally. And, and I started that career, by the way, after kind of finding my activist roots in undergrad. And so when I was in college, I, uh, I worked with uh, survivors of domestic violence, um, doing economic empowerment work for survivors. I uh, was in for low wage workers, right? It's particularly custodial workers. Mm -hmm. um, and I just sort of dabbled in a lot of different social impact areas. And I really loved them all. You were so young. What does that inspire you to be into such a heavy topic? Like what inspired you? I attribute it to the sort of social justice roots of the university that I went to. It was, it's mm -hmm. called Brandeis University. Um, mm -hmm. and, and really just sort of progressive minded students are attracted to that school. And so um, just fell in really quickly with causes that I cared about and didn't really know how to articulate until I sort of found the right people and the right professors um, and the right community to do that. So that was really wonderful. And then I graduated and, you know, had to get a paying job. And um, I think like many uh, young people who graduate college, I took the first job that was offered to me. It was in corporate finance uh, for a large healthcare system. And, you know, in many ways, it was a wonderful first job. I learned a lot. You know, my uh, my Excel skills, I credit to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, made some great friends met my husband, actually, in that, in that job. That's a <laughs> yeah. great job to sum up. Right. Yeah. So it was worth it for that alone. Um, and ultimately... It, it just wasn't a fit. Mm -hmm. I was not energized sort of by the day-to-day -day work. I didn't feel like it was a good use of my skills. It wasn't really igniting my passion. Um, but it was sort of a golden handcuff situation, which I think many of us are familiar with, right? You get, you get paid pretty well. And so you think, well, maybe I should stay. Maybe this just is what work is and I should just suck it up. Mm -hmm. Um, but after four years, I decided I, I wasn't ready <laughs> to suck it up. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if you wake up and enough days when, when your alarm clock goes off and you are praying for a snow day and it's the summer, oh, then I, <laughs> I think that's a good indication that uh, maybe it's time to find that next thing. And so uh, my next thing was business school at Duke, which is something that we have in common. Um, and so moved down to North Carolina uh, for what I thought would just be two years, like just quick, quick down, quick back up to New York and then mm -hmm. uh, stayed <laughs> uh, and, and launched my second career in the social impact space, which you spoke about earlier. Um, and that was sort of the, the re-emergent of my activist roots coming into play, but sort of marrying the causes I cared about, um, but looking at them through a business lens. For many people who are not sure or not very clear about what social impact really is, what social entrepreneurship is, can you use a you know, few words to describe that? And also, what does that mean to you? Why is always kind of in your heart? Yeah. So I've heard the phrase um, social entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. Um, but the idea is that um, we're solving societal problems. 
mm -hmm. um, through this work. And so that could could have to do with any range of issues, right? It's not uh, um, issue specific. So it's anything that that serves people and or planet um, or both um, oh. for the betterment of humanity, society, and the earth. How would and you why, describe why? it? I'm curious. <laughs> I think it's making the world a better place. I think it's, yeah. you know, channel your passion into the project, into a cause that truly make your heart ache. And you know, also helping supporting the other, the community for the betterment holistically. And I'm curious, yeah. Julia, since you are, you know, in that work for so many years to come, what does that mean to you personally? Why is that so important for you? I think the status quo worries me. I don't think that we've ever experienced social progress by saying this is the way things have always been done. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in people who push the boundaries and envelopes of what's normal and expected. Um, and we have a long way to go in terms of progress in so many categories and we need people doing this work. Um, Amazing. So now you are at Duke. So yeah. tell us, how's that <laughs> two year MBA experience? Yeah, so I think, I like to talk about business school because I I hadn't heard business school talked about in the way that I experienced business school. And so now I like to just kind of get it all out there and be honest for anyone who's thinking about business school or for people who have been to business school and had experiences similar to mine. I thought business school was hard. And that feels so like... Hard. Yeah, it was really hard. And that feels for some reason like a controversial point of view. I, I spoke to so many people um, who were just like, it was a two-year vacation. No. Every night we did spring break. And 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 sure, there were parts of it that were fun, but I worked really hard in business school and I struggled. And I think particularly after you've been in the workforce for a number of years, to go back and put your student hat on and to kind of care about grades again is just a problem. Difficult shift. Um, oh, 100%. I, I totally feel you. And I feel like it's hard to describe to people because when you tell people, well, in business school, you are so busy. And people are like, yeah, me too. I have a job. I have brunch. I got a party tonight. Like, I'm busy too. But like, it's hard to describe to people. Yes, I was busy then. But when in business school, it's like busy times 10. Like I can't imagine how does it all fit in the recruiting, the party, the school, the exams. The sip circle, like all and above just happening. And <laughs> the yeah. typical day I'm picturing, I'm wearing a, like a hoodie with my backpack and a high heel in my backpack. So I have to change the bathroom very quickly to my sip circle and be pretty. And yeah, tell me about yourself. Like in that, <laughs> oh my God. Yes, I think you just summarized it perfectly. Yeah, it, you feel like a crazy person. Yeah, and I see a, a question from Jorge Reyes, so I'm just going to answer that in our chat. He says, how did you realize um, I had it and decided to move on to your next project? So what was that moment where I was like, I'm done, I'm moving on. Um, <laughs> so Jorge, I think it's about paying attention to the energy in your body about work. Um, how energized are you on a daily basis by the work that you're doing? How excited do you get about the work? And this is not to say that every day you're going to wake up and feel caffeinated by your calf and just feel like naturally excited every day of your life. I don't, I don't think that that's sort of reasonable. Although I think there are people who have that. Um, <laughs> but, but sort of think about holistically in a week, how many great days did you have? How many bad days did you have? Is that ratio comfortable for you? Maybe having four meh days and one great day feels satisfactory to you. Most of my clients and most people I know would say that's that's not the life I want to live. Um, the, the kind of most finite resource we have is time. And I want to spend my time doing something that feeds my soul. And so I think I, to answer your question, I talked to a lot of people. I saw a therapist. I had a coach. <laughs> so I had a lot of people who were sort of mirroring back to me what my experiences were. So I couldn't ignore them, right? I shut off autopilot. <laughs> um, and autopilot is kind of the most dangerous brain function we can have when it comes to pursuing career paths that really will bring us joy. And I love that, Julia. So um, back to the moment in business, where the two years was so hard, that how do you kind of move forward from there? Yeah, it was hard. And I think one thing in particular that was hard um, is being thrown into this group of really 
just brilliant, like 400 really brilliant, really diverse people and having like making friends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I'm someone who like, it takes me some time to make friends. I, I take my one-on-one, um, friendships really, really seriously. I, I, I don't throw myself into just a group of people for the sake of being in a group. Right? I, I'm like really intentional about my friendships. And so I had a couple really good friends first year, but I didn't sort of feel like I found my people yet. That came second year. And so I, I tell anyone who's going into business school, if you don't have good friends first year, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's really wrong. Um, and so second year, I, I built on the French, some of the friendships that I had in first year that were wonderful, but I also found my social impact community. So I found others who, who saw the world the way I did, that we were in business school sort of to pursue this in- intersection of impact uh, and business, profit and purpose. Uh, and that we wanted to use business as a lens to make the world better. And and some some of those people did end up going into banking or consulting, but they were really intentional about that being a step on the path to something mm-hmm. else, right? to leverage that work to get experience and pay loans or sort of whatever. And then mm-hmm. their journey was going to take them elsewhere. But it was really wonderful to be around people mm-hmm. who, who saw the world the same way that I did. Beautiful. And so do you, right? You, uh, after business school, you took a path in the management consultant, right? Tell us a bit about the journey. So I'll, I'll make just sort of one like tweak to that. It was social impact consulting. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes. So so decidedly different from management consulting. So, so I mean, tell us what's the difference? Yeah. So in management consulting, you think of kind of the big four consulting firms where it's a lifestyle, right? You're on the road Monday through Thursday. You work from home Friday, you get staffed on a project, you work long hours, you kind of can't predict what project you're going to be on. It's in a range of industries. Um, and, and you sort of give your life to these companies for a certain, <laughs> certain number of time. I mean, that, that's really what it is. Um, and also we should say when the, the preparation process for those interviews is really rigorous, right? We know mm-hmm. we've had a lot of classmates go through the casing process and that just felt like people were giving dying. lives to casing, right? It's like the specific way of solving problems during an interview, which um, to me feels like public math. And that's just not something I want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, so I was in social impact consulting and so was heading up, um, the North Carolina kind of branch of a New York based social impact consulting firm. And so my clients were nonprofits and social impact focused organizations. And so while the projects had, um, you know, they were, they were business C in nature, right? We were trying to figure out uh, earned income revenue streams. We were thinking about metrics and measurement, right? It was all sort of the quantitative lens, but the the issues we were solving were all social impact related problems. And does that bring the joy to your heart? Um, it should have, right? Because I, I, I was very intentional about pursuing that path after business school. I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do the, the impressive thing, the consulting thing. Um, and sure. Check, big check, and I'm going to do the good person thing, right? It's going to be in social impact, so check. And so I should have, should, 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 I should have just felt like that was food for my soul and I was just completely satisfied and happy and and good, and I didn't. And that's a tough moment, right? When you put yeah. you this radical shift, when you spend a ton of money on graduate school, move your boyfriend, now husband, to a different state, <laughs> take a wow. job leave your family in New York, right? And then say, ooh, just kidding. <laughs> so let's talk about that moment, right? You know, what you just said is not a light decision or realization, right? So you were in the consulting, you wear this you know, fancy suit, you were talking to your client, you manage your team. What moment, you know, you realize this is not for you and also answer that question, cut off a circle it back. Like, how do you start seeing, you know what? God damn it. All the shit, this is not me. <laughs> Yeah. So it's hard. And I think um, it was a culmination of moments in time. And I can point to one specific day, though. Um, and not ev- not everyone can, some, right? For a lot of us, it's just sort of like the culmination and the snowball effect of, of the toll mm-hmm. that being in the wrong job can take on us emotionally and physically. But I did have one day at work where uh, I was managing a team of 10 consultants and I had my kind of check-in meetings stacked throughout the day. It was a Friday we were talking about their projects, but, you know, like any good manager, I was talking about personal and professional development and goals and kind of all of that stuff. And I just was radically aware of this shift in my 
my energy, the energy in my body when the conversations shifted from personal and professional development to, you know, pulling up their Excel sheets and talking about, you know, the content of their consulting projects. I, I was like a balloon I was fully inflated and excited when we were talking about their goals and who they wanted to be and what was wrong and the interpersonal dynamics and, and more the, the, the soft, I hate that word, but the, the soft stuff. And then if I was a balloon, I was just sort of deflating when the, when the spreadsheets came up and we were like, okay, <laughs> let's like talk about project management. Let's crunch the numbers. It just was, it just wasn't feeding my soul. Um, and I had meeting after meeting after meeting that day where I had that same sensation in my body. And I came home and reflected on it to my husband. And I said, I think this is reflective of what I've been feeling for a long time, which is that I want to develop these people. I want to coach them, but I don't want to manage them. Mm-hmm. And that's a really critical difference. I don't want to manage people. I want to coach them. I had can no you articulate that for people? Can, can, what do you yeah. mean by that? Um, What's the difference? When you manage people, you're you're responsible for that project output, um, and they almost don't come first. <laughs> I think for many many good managers, they do come first, um, but it's it's a balance of output and and making sure that the person functions on behalf of the company and also, you know, throwing in some learning and development um, if you're good. But I really just wanted to focus on learning and development, um, helping them develop skills, articulate goals, um, develop their confidence, um, articulate kind of their values and what um, what energized them, how to translate that into work, uh, how to make a five-year plan, what that looked like, talking about holistic success, right? Not just your job, but what else is in your life that energizes you. Um, those were the conversations I wanted to be having. Why those conversations are just more closer to your heart? Why? Uh, you know, it's it's sort of like, why does a why does a mountain climber love mountain climbing? Like, why does anyone who why does a, a novelist love to write? Um, this is the thing that that feeds me, that brings me authentic joy. This is the thing that makes my heart do this. Oh, so you just want to connect to people and supporting them in their journey, and that brings you so much energy and inspiration. That's right, and I think people who seek coaching are a self selective group of people who want change and who want to be better and who want to be happier. And I'm inspired by people who want to be Mm -hmm. better, get better, do better, feel more aligned, feel more in sync. I'm inspired by people who have that pursuit. Beautiful. Um, Okay. So take us back to that Friday. You had that inspiration. It was like, God damn, this is what I actually wanted to do. But I'm in this fancy job. I got paid so well. And I managed 10 people. And (laughs) now what, right? I mean, that is a hard truth to take and then actually have a courage to pivot, right? How does that share with that journey? Yeah. So the thing about social impact consulting that is sort of, I feel important to say is that the pay isn't good. And particularly for this company, the pay was not good. So this was not a golden handcuff situation. This was not management consulting level salary. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to kiss my lifestyle goodbye. I wasn't getting paid that much. (laughs) So that that part of it was actually not that bad. Um, But relatively still above a lot of people. So relatively still a very comfortable situation, <laughs> put it that way, right? So yeah, I would, I would say so. Um, and uh, I quit, I quit my job without having a plan B. Which Cold was, feet on Monday? I, I quit, yeah, I quit. it was the next week. Um, was that a tough decision for you to come to it? No. Once I made the decision, I was, I was in, I was all in, I was done. Was, was that a scary moment? Like, I, I think that's a big decision or not just a job, but now I think you are pivoting your entire identity, your, your yeah. career and how you see life looking, looking forward. So it's a big decision. Yeah. You know, you mentioned, make it sounds like you only take a week, right? How, how does that, what, was that a scary process? How do you able to, you know, they push through all those questions, the doubt, the fear that oftentimes uh, serve, serve up and still pushing it forward and follow your heart. Yeah, it was terrifying. And I think particularly in the U.S., 
we tie our identities so intimately to our work. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I had to untangle that pretty seriously. And I think that that's a journey for all of us, right? Untangling our worth from our job, mm-hmm. um, which is something we're kind of taught. You you are your job from, from really early on. And that's in business school, definitely still the rhetoric. Um, <laughs> having to say, what would it be like if I wasn't my job? And what would it be like if I led with something that was going to bring me joy and happiness and, Mm -hmm. um, and sort of trusted that if I am aligned in the right thing, then people will pay me money to do that thing. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of trust. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And once I made the decision, I felt just complete relief. It didn't mean I wasn't terrified, Mm -hmm. but I felt an enormous amount of relief. And that, Mm -hmm. that was sort of the beginning of the breaking up with should process for my own life is how beautiful how can I end my relationship with this word through all of these jobs that haven't brought me joy and all of these sort of professional Mm -hmm. experiences where I've learned a lot but authentic joy hasn't really been a part of the puzzle and I had a very supportive partner that's something that I I have to mention because I think privilege is something that um needs to be discussed when we talk about entrepreneurship, right? Like the idea that you can forego an income mm-hmm. for a year or however long it's going to take you to, to generate revenue. The idea that I was well-resourced enough to know how to start a business, right? Um, all of all of those factors are in play. And so, yes, I had a supportive husband who had an income who wanted me to be happy. And so that, that played a huge role too. So the week later, you quit your job. Now, what? You have nothing. You don't really start anything yet. How do you take on that moment to now? Yes. So I did some part-time consulting um, actually at Duke for CASE, the Center for Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, which are my people. I love them so much. They were so good to me. And so it was important for me to have a part-time consulting gig to make some money while I was kind of ideating and thinking. I I wasn't comfortable just like fully quitting. Mm -hmm. Um, Part-time consulting gigs are really helpful when you're in a transition. So that's just a word of advice. Um, it helps, uh, cause when you have the whole week ahead of you to, um, think about how much you don't know and how uncertain your life is, that can be really emotionally difficult. And so having a part-time gig was really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, but I basically took a month and just wrote, I journaled, I talked to people, I thought I researched, um, I played with the word coach, right? I think that word was weird to me because I, I come from a family that, um, values degrees. <laughs> and like my, my dad's a, a physician and my mom's a psychotherapist. And both of those come with advanced degrees where you're qualified to be doing work in a, in a one-on-one capacity. Mm-hmm. Coaching is a really unregulated industry as we know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, what did that mean that I was going into that? Was I qualified? And um, so grappling with a lot of these questions and then ultimately just decided to pull the trigger. <laughs> Wait, so before that whole month, are you going in that month knowing you want to become a coach? Or is through that journaling process, self-reflection, and that that coach, that word just stood out for you? Like, wh- which path were you taking out? So advice for folks who are maybe in the same process of finding what is his or her thing, How what, what kind of process you recommend? So I had no idea that this was going to be coaching, to be honest. I had no idea. Mm-hmm. I had no idea. I mean, I was like, is it freelance consulting? Is it like, is it dog walking? Like, what is it? (laughs) Which by the way, I did dog walk in in graduate school. It was great. Um, (laughs) Another thing like that. Yeah, but I think I I wrote a lot and I just read what I wrote and I talked about it a lot. Um, The way I was describing the type of work I wanted to do, it was impossible to get away from the fact that it was coaching. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, and I toyed with using other words, right? Um, guide. I think that's part of why that, that works in my business, um, teacher. Um, but it all just, it just came back to coaching and, you know, I, I tested the hypothesis. I took on clients, um, for free, uh, and just played around with what my sort of value proposition was, what I was offering the tools and services and and the type of coach that I was until it sort of formed itself. And then people started paying me and, a lot happened, at, but um, now now I run a successful coaching practice. So basically, it's that one month you figured out that thing, and the magic just happened. So yeah. what is the entrepreneur journey? Like, is it just as easy as that sounds? It is not. And any entrepreneur who tells you that there aren't days where they want to just completely throw their hands in the air and quit is lying. Um, there have been those days, and I think for someone like me who's who. 
I really like instant gratification. Being an entrepreneur is hard because um, this analogy has been with me since day one. Um, the, the, the seeds don't grow the day that you plant them. And so what that means is you're you're putting in place all of these different strategies. You're planting, you're planting, you're you're burying, you're watering, you're hoping for sunlight, right? And you can't really predict when that little sprout is going to come up. All you can control is how many seeds you plant. And so that metaphor was just with me kind of the first year of my business in terms of building relationships with corporations, with people, telling talking about what I do, speaking on panels, doing public mm-hmm. speaking, right? Speaking for free um, when when the chance arose just to get in front of more people, right? And sort of just taking opportunities and taking them and taking them. And then, you know, you slowly see three months later, six months later, a client comes out of that or a new organization reaches out to you to, to speak, right? And so the more seeds you plant, the more success you have. And that takes patience and it takes time. What is the hardest thing that you felt um, you have overcome throughout the whole entrepreneur journey? So I think isolation is one of them. It's when you're on your own, particularly as a solopreneur, figuring out how to structure your time and build in socialization when you don't have coworkers other than my dog, who's right here. You can't see her. Um, So I think social isolation was definitely a piece. So figuring out how to plug myself into communities of people who could act as my colleagues, even if they weren't. And so I've, I've through a lot of work, found some amazing communities of people who I do feel like are colleagues at this point. Um, Another one, and, and perhaps the hardest one for me, is is simply patience. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, year one, your cash flow isn't going to be what you want it to be. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's an investment. You're making an investment in yourself. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I have to go back and, and give myself a word of advice, it would just yeah. be patience. It would just be patience. Because I think, you know, that day when you plant a million seeds and none of them flower, you're like, all right, this is it. <laughs> Yeah. But um, but no, it just it takes time. Amazing. So for folks who may be also starting their own entrepreneur journey today or tomorrow, um, so you think patience is the word you'll give to them? Patience, yeah. Patience. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so is you know you've been down this journey for a couple, you know, a year or two now, right? Is this everything you wanted it? The moment that you quit your job, the moment you decide this is not for me when you end that consulting gig and you want to pivot, right? Is today what you want? Fresh back to that moment. Mm, I so appreciate this question. The reason I appreciate it is because I think, and, and this is the reason my book is titled what it's titled, Breaking Up With Should, in the tense that it that it is in, right? Not broken up with should, not I've already done it, it's done. Mm-hmm. But continuously breaking up with should, continuously breaking up with um, societal expectations of success or what I've been sort of raised to think success is. Um, And I think what we don't do as entrepreneurs enough is pause and celebrate the successes. And so I appreciate that question because I'm in this moment sort of pausing and saying, yeah, you know, two years ago when I set out with this vision, um, I never would have thought that my business was would be 100% referral based, um, that I would command the fees that I charge, that I would write for Forbes, that I was named a business insider, you know, coach of the year of 2020, um, wow. that I'm being asked to speak, right? Like all of these things that you're like, this is the, this will probably never happen, but if I had to sort of daydream, and that, that is what's, ha- that's what's happened. Um, and I, I'm appreciating this moment of just sort of recognizing that and sitting with it. And, and you know what that speaks to though? When you're in work that really aligns with your energy, it doesn't feel as much like work. Like it didn't feel like I was pulling teeth to get all of this stuff done. It was just sort of a natural extension of my energy, right? Like the Forbes thing, I had things to say and I did a lot of writing and I had a a lot of opinions. um, And it turned out that those opinions resonated with people. And through all of the connections I built through all of these uh, kind of informal communities that I referred to earlier, right? I was able to connect with and make a friend who wrote for Forbes and made the introduction, right? And so it just all happened much more naturally than I think I would have thought. That is so beautiful. I love that. Sounds like you just put yourself in the right spot and all the right magic just happened. Us as dreamy yeah. as it was, but you're the one accomplished all of those in just short of two years. That's incredible. Thank you. I have, sorry, my hair, this is the, I hate this about Zoom, how we, like, I always just look at my hair. This one piece of hair is so bothering me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Better. 
You look beautiful. <laughs> Anyone with curly hair watching, you get me. You get me. It's not. <laughs> I, oh my God. You are just so adorable. Um, Julia, I love that. And I'm curious, you know, two years in, right? You accomplished so much things. And uh, it sounds like exactly what you anticipate the day you put your resignation letter. And I'm thinking, reflect back a decade, right? Since the moment that you started this, you know, world journey, right? This, um, the real world. Who, how, who do you have become? Because at the end of the day, it's not about the things that we have. It's not about the house we bought. It's not about the dog that we have. It's about, really, at the end of the day, who you have become. And I'm curious about who have you transformed through this whole uh, experience, right? Whether it's uh, in finance, investing, consulting, MBAs, and now in a coach, this capacity, who have you become? I aspire to be curious and kind. I think those two words are really powerful. I think the pursuit of curiosity serves us so well in our, in our lifetimes. It's both getting curious with ourselves and getting curious with others, genuine curiosity. Um, I think curiosity can help build bridges between people. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think kindness again, both to ourselves and to others. Isn't that so hard? Be kind to ourselves. Because at the end of the day, as a high achiever yourself, you probably know we are hardest to ourselves than anything else. So I think having that patience, having that kindness to yourself and truly listen to your own heart, accepting who we are, breaking that should when those moments come about and follow your heart, taking all the courage and truly live life with passion. That is not an easy journey at all. It's really not. It's really not. And I do believe, like you said, Wen, that it that it starts with how we talk to ourselves and mm-hmm. and the compassion that we're exercising towards ourselves, you know. What does that voice sound like, that voice that you talk to yourself with? How can you get in touch with that voice? Do you have any word of advice for folks that maybe today, you know, in the stage of still figured out who he or she is, maybe still figured out, is it a should? So anyone who's listening, um, I would love for you to pre-order my book, which is called Breaking Up With Should. It's on my website. Um, I can type in the the link if that's helpful. I'm going to put a link here. Yeah, in the below. No problem. And and so in my book, um, I do talk about how to identify what I call maladaptive shoulds versus good shoulds, right? Not all shoulds are bad. Um, so what's a maladaptive should and what's a good should? And so how, how do I identify those? And so the first step I would just advise people on, um, again, combating autopilot was when we just go and don't think or reflect, develop a journaling practice. And that doesn't have to be scary. No one has to see it. It could be a sentence a day. It could be on your phone. It could be written. Make some time to reflect on what your experiences are, because when you see that facing you, staring at you, it's really hard to ignore. Um, and commit to the process of writing because that's how I believe our, our brains kind of process what's happening to us. And so if you need a small step to start somewhere, start writing. But how do you listen to that shirt? Think about the energy in your body. And so when you're doing a task, what feelings do you associate with that task? Is it dread? Does your heart sink? Are you trying to get it over with as quickly as possible? Do you feel sad? Do you feel deflated? Do you feel demotivated? Do you feel numb? Do you feel neutral? Do you feel despondent? Do you feel complacent? Or do you feel energized? Do you feel excited? Do you feel curious? How do you feel about tasks? Ask yourself those questions and write and reflect. Your body and your gut is going to be the best indication of whether something is a should versus whether uh, something is actually a passion. And so I like to say your gut is your smartest organ. <laughs> your gut is the one that's telling you what to do. Just get in tune with it. I love that. So ladies and gentlemen, if now you're also in a process, just get curious, pick out your pain, pick out your phone, start writing, journaling, and really listen to the voice. Is that a sighty shirt or is that, God damn it, I'm dragging my feet kind of shirt. <laughs> And making a choice and truly trust yourself, follow your heart and follow your own path. I am curious, Julia, um, throughout the whole journey, right? If you look back the past decade or so, think about a person you are becoming today, people who are so kind and so curious to yourself and the world. Would you change anything in the journey? Mm. You have that magic wand. Not for a second. I wouldn't yeah. change I wouldn't change a single thing about my journey. Um Every bad job I had, every bad 
verbally abusive boss I had <laughs> led me to where I am right now. Every bad experience I had at work is a Forbes article, <laughs> quite literally, right? Like everything. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of spiritual in the way that I, I believe everything happens for a reason. I don't, but I do believe that, um, I am in the midst of my, the perfectly written novel of my life right now. And that each chapter that came before informed the chapters that exist now. Um, yeah. and that are making me who I am, which I'm very grateful to be that person. Beautiful. So let's talk about the chapter. What is the next chapter for you? And what is the beautiful chapter, like a perfect chapter in your mind? Survive the pandemic, survive the results of this election. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this isn't talked about a lot in for entrepreneurs and people who start businesses and in business school, but I, I want I want a family. I want children. Um, and I, I want to raise my children. Uh, so I want to be there for them. And so I, I, many things that are wonderful about this career is that I can sort of scale up and scale back when I, when I wish, um, and spend time with my family and my friends. Uh, that's, that's sort of my next chapter, I think, is just getting my business to a place where it's humming, um, get really intentional about outsourcing. I think that's something that entrepreneurs probably don't do fast enough because <laughs> we feel like we have to do everything ourselves, right? So what is a what is a task that it's not essential that you do, that you can pay someone else to do mm -hmm. versus what is essential that you do, right? For me, it's coaching and writing. Mm -hmm. So I need to do those things, but having someone else do all the other things. So that's kind of the next chapter for me. Um, and then really continuing to focus on holistic well-being. You know, I, I've got to practice what I preach to my clients, right? So how am I focusing on physical fitness and nutrition and activities that bring me joy and taking naps when I need to nap and uh, resting and um, time with my loved ones, right? And so that just continues to be a really strong focus for me. Beautiful. I love that Julie have such a holistic approach. And I love you mentioned, right? Oftentimes in MBA, in business school, we don't really talk about the fulfillment holistically, whether it's raising a family, go for a hike, um, go take a yoga, go take a nap when you feel like it. Those are all sounds a little bit trivial, but yet so important as a big piece of puzzle in the holistic success or whatever you want to call it for your life right i yeah. love how you pointed out and julia i do want to um spend some minutes to talk about um so for people who are curious about you and how to find you and how to collaborate with you so can you share with a little bit about your business and what kind of support you are providing and how can folks uh, uh, co collaborate with you yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I'm a coach and I call myself a career confidence coach. So I don't work as much with folks in career transition. I work with folks who are looking to get more intentional about leadership, um, and confidence and defining sort of a direction. Tell us a little bit about the imposter syndrome and a lot of us who are high achievers all have them. So First of all, what is imposter syndrome? And if you are, you know, anybody who are high achievers having that feeling, having that, how would you advise to overcome that? Yeah. So this is an hour long presentation, but let me condense it into, <laughs> into 30 seconds here. So imposter syndrome is a feeling of fraudulence among people who are uh, quite successful. So you are generally pretty smart, pretty high achieving, but yet you have this pervasive feeling like you're faking it and you're going to be found out. That's called imposter syndrome. It was originally studied in the 1970s um, by two scientists who wrote a, a paper on it. And it was originally studied in women because these, uh, these two scientists thought that this was a phenomenon that mostly affected high achieving women. We actually now know that it affects women and, and men equally, um, but that was the original research and data. Um, I want to do one small, one small. No, please, please. In my mind. When I'm in business school, taking a DMON class, do you remember the <laughs> model? I was like, oh my God, I'm blowing my mind. And I went to the professor's office one day. Um, I forgot what's his name, but he's so handsome. Like, you will remember him. He it's just, oh my God. Like I was just saying the first, first row and just looking, just fold up like, oh my God, you're so handsome. You're so smart. And I have no idea what I'm doing. So I go to the office hour and tell him, oh my God, professor, you are so great. But I have no idea how to do this homework. What is like a optimization, like damn airplanes. I have zero idea. And he was like, when have you heard of imposter syndrome? <laughs> That's a beautiful accent, right? And I was just like, look at him, all the charm. I was like, 
I love you, Professor. I have no idea. So he sent me this <laughs> word I spelled out. So I go home and Google that. That's the first I ever heard of that damn word. And it's so beautiful. And as you explain that, the moment of me sitting in the office hour with my professor who was so charming and so handsome. <laughs> and that moment just refract back to my memory. But continue. Um, I love you so much. I just need to say that. And like also, you are very beautiful and very smart. So it's just funny how we discount ourselves when we feel like we're not worthy of the room that we're in or, or the intellect of other people. What, what we're discounting is a lot of other people are feeling that same way. You know what? That's, what before, that's the hardest thing I feel like I personally have to go overcome. Like when you watch and sit with a 400 brilliant do MBA, you're sitting there like, God damn it. They are so smart. It took me an entire one year to realize I am one of them. So do I. Yeah, but thank you for for acknowledging that. That's just oh, yeah, you are one of them, and believe me, I too still struggle with with those feelings. The first day of financial accounting sticks out in particular. <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's a goddamn demon. The eight hours exam. Do you remember if you take that class? I was like, I didn't hours. take demons for that reason. Oh, I think I took I maxed out all my man comp classes. <laughs> Anyhow, so we talk about imposter syndrome and then you were about to tell us how do you overcome that? If you do find yourself one of those beautiful people, successful, but yet moment to come, realize, damn, am I fake? Am I fraud? Is someone going to report me? How do you advise? Yeah. So the first thing I will say that it's a practice, not a pill. I wish I could give you a little pill through the camera right now to cure your imposter syndrome. I can't. (laughs) But the first and kind of most studied way to help combat it feels really counterintuitive because we carry these feelings with shame and with secrecy, right? We don't tell anyone that we're feeling this way. So actually one of the best ways to combat it is to talk about it, to do exactly what we're doing now, which is to say, oh, I feel kind of like I'm faking it. Kind of feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. How about you? That feels terrifying. That feels like a risk, but that actually helps us feel better because we connect with other people who are feeling the same way. It normalizes it. We realize we're not alone. And it decreases the shame and the secrecy that are associated with these feelings of I'm secretly faking it. I'm secretly a fraud. um, And I'm the only one who's a fraud, by the way. (laughs) Right. And so talking about it is just the first biggest piece of advice I would give. Okay. So first talk about it. What is second? I see the second coming. For the second one, you're going to have to pay me to do a workshop. (laughs) Wow. Okay. But is there any like a, 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 Dense insight you can share, just a short quick blur. So we talked about this already, but I would say start to get intentional about noticing the voice that you use to talk to yourself. Mm, so be so kind to a, yourself. It is about insight first, right? So insight means understanding more about yourself. So instead of being on autopilot with how you talk to yourself, start to notice and in a non-judgmental way, how you're talking to yourself, right? So don't judge how you're talking to yourself, but just simply notice it. So guys, if you also experience the imposter syndrome, really, there are two simple steps. Number one, talk about it. Connect with people, share your experience. So there's no shame anymore. And you are not in the club, in the secret anymore. That's one. Secondly, be aware. You know, use a kind language to yourself and truly listen to you what you said to yourself and truly make sure you use the right language. You are not a flaw. You are beautiful. You are successful the way you are. So there's no secret. You are perfect to sum up. You are not the top imposter syndrome. I hope I said your job correctly. Yeah. And, and I would say like nobody is perfect. And as long as you are committed to growth and that it's okay to not know all the answers because none of us know all the answers. Um, even Albert Einstein did not have all the answers. Um, let's all just normalize gaps in our knowledge collectively because no one can possibly know everything. And so the pursuit, again, of curiosity and questions are beautiful. I love that, Julia. I love that you share such a beautiful journey with us. I love that you are 
so brave, so bold, and really listen to your own heart and just follow it through, even though it sounds so scary, taking the leap when the moment that doesn't seem very obvious or clear to you, but you're taking the path anyway. And today, seeing the beautiful, beautiful future you are creating for yourself and all the people around you and incredible community you are uh, impacting, which is so beautiful. Um, is there anything else you want to share with the audience that I have not asked today, Julia? No, I just want to thank you for creating the space and providing the forum for this conversation. It's been such a pleasure and I'm so excited for our continued friendship. Yes. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in today. Hope you have a magical Tuesday and thank you so much, Julia. You are so wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Wen. Take care, everyone.